We pray you bless us today as we study your word together, that you enlighten our understanding and that you pour out your Holy Spirit upon us as we look forward to the day of Jesus coming. In his name we pray, amen. Last week I forgot for 20 minutes and now, so sorry about that. If, so Rachel will, will get a chance to see us from the beginning this time, except for the invocation there, almost from the beginning this time. So welcome back to Revelation chapter 20. And last time we, and I forgot to bring my sheets of paper, but last time we talked about the different views of what is called the millennium. And this may, this may be the, the most controverted or controversial chapter in the book of Revelation and has given birth to a lot of different theories and, and ideas about what the end times will be like. And some of those were, well, it's the sheet of paper that I gave to you, probably the dominant one in evangelicalism today is, thank you, <laughs> the, probably the dominant one in evangelicalism today is, is premillennial dispensationalism. And uh, the idea there being that Christ will come and reign, there's a bug on my screen, that Christ will come and reign on the earth for, for a literal 1,000 year period, and that after he is, you know, most of them would say that after Christ has already raptured his church out of this world, he's going to reign for a thousand years, then there's going to be a release of Satan, and, and then his return in judgment. And I guess, you know, the kind of harmful thing about that is, in one sense, it it gives Christians a false hope that we won't be there during the Great Tribulation. And, and everywhere that I read in Scripture is instead telling us to be ready, that we have to be prepared to undergo this, uh, these, these terrible times in the last days. And then the second part of that is, is the idea that Christ is, that after Christ, if Christ raptured his church out of the world, how would there be any mass conversion of the Jews or anyone else? Because faith comes through hearing the word. And if there's no church there to spread it, then how are people going to come to to be brought to, to Christ and, and converted by the power of the Holy Spirit? So ours is, our understanding of the, of the millennium is essentially that right now, we live in in the church age is what John is really talking about when he talks about the thousand years, that it is a symbolic period of time and that it, it's the period of time since Christ ascended into heaven until he returns again. So it, you, in that we are called amillennialists. Right? You want to brag to people that you're, oh, I'm an amillennialist. So we would be considered amillennialists, and that is just to say that our understanding of the last days is Christ ascended to heaven, sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and from thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom will have none. That's it. That's, that's how the last days are going to shake out. Jesus is in charge, then Jesus is coming again. And then he's going to take his church to heaven. New heavens and new earth and all that good stuff. So Revelation 20 is, is you know, kind of the ground zero of that, that war over the passages and, and deciding. And I, I just refer you to a few places, like in Matthew chapter 18. <clears throat> not Matthew, Revelation. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to do that to you. I want you all jumping into Matthew here. But Revelation 18, you, you, we had the Christ is his war against the false church and the fall of Babylon and the judgment of the people of um, the judgment of, of the false Christians, the false church, and the church is, is resounding in praise for that. Then at the beginning of chapter 19, it says, after this, meta tautu, tautal, after this, or after these things, 
I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven. And so after the defeat of the false church, you get the saints in heaven that are praising God. And it's sequential. Chapter 18 happened. The, the false church is defeated. Chapter 19 comes. And after that defeat of the church, the saints in heaven are rejoicing. You got a picture of the new, the, uh, the saints in heaven and all that stuff, the marriage feast of the Lamb. But chapter 19, he starts with meta tau ta after these things. Okay, so he gives us that time stamp of what of what's going on. At the beginning of chapter 20, he says, it says, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. And I would just say, it just the word there is chi, it's just and, uh, it can mean even also, but and is what the word means. There is no time element in it. So in other words, chapter 19, he's saying, this kind came after chapter 18, came next. That's absent in this chapter. And I think that that's an important thing to remember because we've just had the rejoicing in heaven and all that stuff in chapter 19. And now somebody might say, oh, now there's going to be a thousand year reign of Christ. Just drop out of your mind the this follows this. It's just another sign that he receives, another sign from heaven. It's not after these things. <coughs> yeah. All right, well, anyway. So then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain, and he seized the dragon that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan and bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. And that, you know, on that chart, that's where the idea of Satan's little season comes in there that from verse uh, three. But, all right, so as long as we understand this, this isn't necessarily, we still have to figure out when this comes in, but in the language of it, there's nothing that would cause us to say this must come after, after the saints are rejoicing in heaven and all that stuff. This is just a new a new vision or dream that he receives. Um, I saw an angel. It's you know most of the time whenever he sometimes he will use an another angel, and oftentimes he will if if he uses a definite article, it'll be it's, t and taken note of in a, in some special way. There'll be something special he identifies about it. It, there is none of that. There's no article with this one. So it seems like he's probably not either not one of the seven angels or or not one that has been recognized before in the book. I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. Um, the key. Let me see. Let's look at... If you look at chapter 9, you remember in chapter 9, <clears throat> now this is the second vision in, in you, we had the seals in chapter 7 and all that, <coughs> in, and here we have the, in chapter 9, the fifth angel blew his trumpet. And I saw a star fallen from, from heaven to earth, and he was given the key to the shaft of the bottomless pit. He opened the shaft of the bottomless pit, and from the shaft rose smoke like the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened with smoke from the shaft. Now, I don't know. The, the difference between, I'd say, between chapter 9 and chapter 20 is he's talking about the shaft of the abyss here in chapter 9. In chapter 20, he doesn't, 
doesn't use that same language. He just talks about an abyss, whether we should make anything of that or not. I'm not certain. But remember, whenever we talked about the seven seals and the seven trumpets and the seven bowls, we talked about that period of time that Christ, that period of time that was from Christ's ascension through his second coming, through his return. It was a picture of the events that were unfolding on earth, even, even at the present time. And this fifth angel, after he blows his trumpet and he's, he receives the key to the shaft of the abyss, opens it and, you know, we can imagine it, just the, the putrid smoke flowing up into the air as, as he's unleashing demonic judgment on, on the world at that point. And uh, so it's, there you have the key. Again, in chapter 3 in Revelation, he talks about the key. In chapter 3, I think it's verse 7. It says, it's, Jesus said to the church in Philadelphia, to the angel of the church in Philadelphia, write the words of the Holy One, the true one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will shut, who shuts and no one opens. That's a, it's Jesus, isn't it? He's the one that holds the key of David. And, you know, back in chapter 1 of, of Revelation, you have Jesus on in verse 17 saying, Fear not, I am, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. So in Revelation, Jesus is the one who's, who bears the keys, the authority. He's the one that that has the power in his hands. Here he's bequeathed it to the, to the angel, and the angel's not acting on his own authority, but acting under the authority of Jesus as he comes, it's, has the key to the bottomless pit. And it says, and a, a great chain. I just That's interesting because you think of, you think of in Mark chapter 5, where Jesus meets the Gerizim demoniac, the man who is, is, possessed by Satan. And in Mark 5, I think 3 and 4, he talks about that no chain could, no, he, this guy lived out in the tombs and no chain could restrain him. So this is a mega chain, literally, in the, in the text itself. So the Gerizim demoniac might have been, might have been unleashed there and, and couldn't be restrained, but this great chain is going to do the job because the one who's wielding it is, is doing so under the authority of Christ. Um, so, and, you know, I think the first question we're pro probably trying to, the mystery here to solve for us is, is, is there anything in here that tells us when the binding happens? I mean, that's, that's the... Is whenever you go to the diagrams of, of the millennium that we talked about last week, is that's the great question, is when did all of this happen? Because we've already seen it's kind of an uh, ambiguous time statement there. There really isn't one. But he's given a great key to, and a great chain, a mega chain. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, Remember we had that same language of, of Satan in Revelation chapter 12. And I'm telling you, Revelation 12 is a good... You could read Revelation 12 and Revelation 20 together because they're talking about the same events. Remember Revelation 12, God snatches the, the child up to heaven. That's Jesus ascending. And then the woman flees into the, the wilderness and where she's protected by God, and the devil is, is going to go and make war against her offspring. It's Jesus is going to protect his church there in chapter 12. Through all of this time after the ascension of Christ, Jesus is going to protect his church, but the devil is going to make war against the offspring of God and try to destroy it. But we have that comfort that she's been carried in eagle's wings into the wilderness where she's going to be protected. Well, that's 
chapter 12 is is a good where we get that where we first meet the devil as the ancient serpent who is the devil which means a slanderer i mean the devil means a slanderer somebody who's a, who's falsely accusing you before before a judge and satan means adversary and he bound him for a thousand years and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. So how do we think about a thousand years? And are there our dispensationalist friends, and it's probably Baptist Assemblies of God, a lot of, a lot of different evangelical churches would view that as a literal 1,000-year reign of Christ that's going to occur at some distant point in the future, whether the church is here or not, they, you know, they vary in their views of that. But I would ask if if there's a, a any other guiding way for us to think of that one thousand years beyond the insistence that it must intend a literal one thousand year, where Jesus takes up, you know, capital in Jerusalem and rules over an earthly reign. You know, we have other reasons for, for disbelieving that view. Namely, Jesus said, my kingdom isn't of this world. So we tend to take him at his word that he's not interested in earthly reign here, but a, a new heavens and a new earth. And a couple of those places that I think can guide us are Psalm 90, verse 4. <coughs> Just answering the question, what is, how do we, what do we make of a thousand years? <coughs> Excuse me. Is his, is it a literal time period or not? And Psalm 90 verse 4, you, you probably are aware of, of the two places in scripture that talk about a thousand years. And Psalm 90 says, for a thousand years in your sight are but as yesterday when it is past, or as a watch in the night. And whatever else you want to say about Psalm 90, verse 4, it's a thousand years is kind of humanly speaking a long period of time, or it seems like a long period of time. And in the, in the divine perspective, isn't much. Right? It's, just, it's like, like a watch in the night in God's. It might seem like a long time to us. So the, he's not talking about a, a literal 1,000-year period in that he's, it's a descriptive way of saying so that what seems like forever in our, in our view isn't much in God's view. You know, the other place where 1,000 years is, is used in Scripture is in 2 Peter chapter 3. in verse 8 it says but do not overlook this one fact beloved that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness but he is patient toward you not wishing that any should perish but that all should reach repentance but the day of the Lord will come like a thief you know, again, in Second Peter chapter three, it's really the same thing. Is in Second Peter chapter three, is his his point there isn't a a literal one thousand years, but how insignificant a huge block of time would be compared to it, it for us. Whenever you put it in the in the perspective of God, um, there's another. Oh, I thought there was another thousand in, in Psalm ninety. But um, another verse that can is kind of in, informative. At least it doesn't talk about a thousand years. But if you look at at Psalm fifty, and it's Psalm fifty verse ten, it says, "For every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills." Okay. It's, what is he reading about cattle for? What's it have to do with anything? It is just to say that the thousand, he's not talking about literally a thousand hills 
it's his way of saying it's all God's. It's the the cattle on a thousand hills are his. He's not saying, well, okay, there's this this one, two, three, four, let's count up which ones belong to God. He's saying they're all they all belong to God. So it's a very figurative way of, of speaking and a symbolic <laughs> way of, of speaking. And I'd suggest that that's a good way to guide us into to understanding understanding Revelation 20. And, and Psalm 50, the cattle on a thousand hills are his. It's all his. It's, it's a thousand hills. It's a way of speaking of completion. And there's another verse that I thought was in Psalm 92. Not 92, but 90 also. And I and I can't find it whenever it's whenever it's right in front of me. So it's it's probably in a different place, but it says essentially the same thing where a thousand is being used to express no, not just one thousand particular ones, but it is all God's. It all belongs to God. Now that's how I'm suggesting we read here the the binding that God's is Satan is being bound for a thousand years. That it is you know, in our in however long it is, it's a period of time that might seem long to us, but in God it's nothing. But it's a, a time of completion. It's all of the time that God needs to unfold the events of the last days, and that is where we get the the idea or the what's intended by the thousand years that He's bound and thrown into the pit. Second Peter three, yep. Second Peter three verse eight. Okay, so, um, so that's how how we would understand one thousand years. We're not just throw, throwing out the idea of a literal one thousand years because we're not just throwing that out because it does is uncomfortable to us. But there are good exegetical reasons from Scripture, namely the other period verses that talk about a thousand years aren't using that aren't using that um, that time reference as a literal but a figurative way of using that word so the second one is is so the Satan who is the devil he's Satan he's bound for a thousand years thrown into the pit shut and sealed over him you know a seal of course they would seal things like Jesus too. I think in Matthew 27, Jesus, the, they asked Pontius Pilate to go out and seal the tomb. That meant that no one can open it. It's, it is shut. The only person that can get into this is the one who's authorized by the one who bears the seal. That's, you could seal tombs, you could seal envelopes, you could seal all kinds of prisons, all kinds of things like that. To, but this is Satan is going to be bound for a thousand years and shut away and sealed over him until the one until the one who's who's bound him releases him. And that brings a whole new question. What's the purpose behind his release? Well, we'll get to that eventually. So when did this happen? It's, it's really the important question for us is wh when was Satan bound and are there any Bible passages in Scripture that answer that question or give us some direction for understanding when Satan's going to be bound? Is it, you know, it's, a lot of people think that this is some moment in the future where Satan is going to be bound and then Christ is going to inaugurate a 1,000-year rule. Well, there are a few passages in Scripture, in the Gospels, that talk about the binding of Satan. And we'll give a look to those. Excuse me. If you look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 29. <coughs> oh, boy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm talking too much. Matthew chapter 12 and, and 
verse 29. Let's start at verse 25. Because Jesus is, is in his ministry. They're bringing people to Jesus. He's healing them. He's casting out demons. And more and more, he is really making the Pharisees mad. <clears throat> and they're, you know, they're accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of, of Beelzebul, if, of the, by Satan's power. Knowing their thoughts, Jesus said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste. And no city or house divided against itself will stand. And if Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. All right, so think about what's going on in these passages. They're accusing Jesus of casting out demons by the power of the devil. And Jesus is saying, no, then Satan's kingdom would be divided against itself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? It's kind of interesting. Seem, seems to indicate that they actually do cast out demons also. Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the Spirit of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. So something different is going on clearly He's saying that it's the kingdom of God that's come upon you in my life and ministry. <clears throat> and this is the, the part that I would suggest is a parallel to the binding of Satan. Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? Then indeed he may plunder his house. So he enters into this kind of parable statement or formula of, of a strong man having his house plundered, that the only way that this is possible is, is if he binds the strong man. Whoever is not with me is against me, whoever, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. Therefore, every, I tell you, every sin and blasphemy will for, be forgiven people, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven. Jesus is the one in Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, who is, he's describing his ministry as he has broken into the world with God's kingdom to bind the strong man. And it's the same, same uh, word, deo, binding, of, that is used in chapter 20 in Revelation. Jesus is the one who comes to bind Satan so he can steal his kingdom. And, and, you know, that's not unusual for us. It's uncomfortable for us, but sometimes the, the, the Bible describes this as the, the, the devil's kingdom, this, the world that we live in. Well, Jesus, in his ministry, came to bind him, to restrain the strong man. Uh, if, uh, another parallel passage to that is in Mark chapter 3. These are probably, if it seems, <clears throat> you know, these are probably the, the most important ones, for, in my view, for helping us to understand what, what it means that Satan is bound and when this might have happened. In Mark chapter 3, verse 27, and we'll just start at verse 25 again. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan is risen up against himself and is divided he cannot stand, but is coming to an end. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. That's what Jesus is doing. He's binding the strong man. And, and how's he doing it? In his ministry of preaching and teaching and casting out demons, Jesus is binding Satan. Right. The other one is, is in Luke chapter 11. It's the same, same parallel passage in, in Luke chapter 11. It only... Um, 
the only only difference there. Right? I'll start chapter 11, verse 20. It says, but if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather with me scatters. There's, there's three passages. They're all the same, describing the same event where Jesus is saying he's the one that in his life and ministry, in the, in the nonstop back and forth battle of Jesus casting out demons and preaching the gospel, he is binding the strong man. And the difference in Luke is it introduces another word. It says, uh, but when one stronger, iskuderos, is the, the word that he uses, then one stronger than, than he attacks. Jesus is the stronger one. If you look at, at it uses that same iskuderos. When John the Baptist, they ask him, hey, are you, are you the Christ? And he says, no, there's one that's iskuderos. There's a stronger one than me that's coming. So Jesus is the, the stronger man that's come to bind Satan. This is, these are the only passages in the Gospels that shed light for us on when is the binding of, what, what do we mean by the binding of Satan and when does it happen? And John kind of gives us, it, John uses a little different language in his Gospel for it, but it's, you know, I think it's, it's probably important to notice how John describes the work of Christ in oh let me see I have to see if I wrote down where oh verse I think it says 31 I can't read my <laughs> my own writing if you look at this so this is how John described what Jesus is doing to Satan through Jesus ministry um, in at verse 30 of chapter 12. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. So Jesus calls him the ruler of this world. He is the strong man, but Jesus is the escuderos. He's the stronger one that John the Baptist said was the stronger one who was coming, and you just have to look at his baptisms, the, those narratives in the baptism of Christ to see that passage. But Jesus is saying, his, so when is the, why am I doing this? Because this is the most important question for us, is when is Satan bound? In the Gospels, the picture of, of Satan being bound, it's done by Jesus, and it is, in the life and the ministry and work of Jesus Christ. John has it here whenever whenever he's when the son of man's lifted up he's going to draw all people to himself. Um, John 16 has another parallel to that uh, language. In chapter 16 verse 11 um, John again says when the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict. Um, uh, let me see if that is the one. I don't know that that's the one I wanted to. Oh, he's talking about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He will convict concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you will see me no longer concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world is judged. So this, so this is how we have taken the binding of Satan, is that in the life and the work and the ministry of Jesus, that he is the one who is restraining the devil and bound Satan so that the church can accomplish her work. He's the stronger one who's come to, to plunder Satan's kingdom. And 
that we live in this period of time that's that that is unfolding that satan is being bound that god is and it's the same thing in chapter 12 whenever in chapter 12 it's pictured differently because it says he's going to take the the woman away and protect her and care for her in the wilderness god's protecting and caring for the church satan's not going to destroy her the devil then goes to make war on the offspring but He's keeping the, the faithful woman, his church, safely. That's what God does for his church during this period of the thousand years. A um, couple other passages, if you, th these are very close, so that makes it easy. But Jude chapter 6, it's not chapter 6, there's only one chapter in Jude, but in Jude verse 6, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> right, and Jude's, Jude's telling Christians, teaching Christians to contend for the faith delivered to the saints. And, and uh, verse 5, now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus who saved a people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling he is kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day just as sodom and gomorrah and the surrounding cities which likewise indulged in in second in sexual immorality now you know, he, he doesn't Whenever it says this, this, the angels that didn't stay within their realm of authority, it says he's kept them in eternal chains under gloomy darkness. And yet, whenever we look at the world, that we, it doesn't appear to us that they are chained. And I, Luther described the devil as a mean dog on a chain. And maybe that's a better way for us to think about it is is that while the devil is is restrained he's he's chained and and is no threat to us he can't he can't snatch us away from god he's not no one can can separate you from the love of christ but like a, a mean dog tied up on the out in somebody's yard if you go play with them you're kind of opening yourself up to great danger and i think that that's that's the idea that's being described there with Satan in, in the angels kept in eternal chains. Clearly, they're, they have more freedom than we would like them to have. I mean, this the devil still is living and, and, and active, and he is prowling like a roaring lion in these last days. But against God's church, he has no authority and no power unless I go play with the mean dog. And that's a, you know, that's a foolish decision on, on our part. In, in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4, it says, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but he cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a herald of righteousness. Again, in verse 4, you get the chains of gloomy darkness. But it's not, but it doesn't keep the devil from, from tempting and from trying to do his worst to destroy the things that God has created good that that binding doesn't he is still active in this world he's a liar he's the father of lies jesus said so we're not surprised that that he spreads his lies and yet we also know that that christ is the stronger one who has bound him he cannot go beyond the limits that god has set for him and if in god's wisdom 
I think this belongs to the realm of faith. If, if for whatever reason God chooses to, to send Jesus, who by his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, has bound Satan and, and you know, tied him in knots, if he allows Satan to still prowl like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, then we have to understand that it's only going to accomplish God's purpose. And if, if the devil might do his worst to destroy God's church, but he's going to preserve and keep her through these last days to accomplish the mission. All right, any questions or thoughts? <clears throat> Clear as mud. No. That was a long kind of way of trying to answer the, the first question of when did the binding take place? And it is... You know, another verse to think about in Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out the, the, the disciples and they go preach the gospel. And, and he sees them whenever they come back and he's asking for the update. And, and they tell, oh, even we cast out demons in your name, all these wonderful things. And Jesus said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So, you know, there were early church fathers that, that believed in, in the incarnation of Christ, that Satan was bound. I don't think there's any, some that it was the ascension of Christ. Really, it's just in the work of Jesus. All through that time that, that he is, his triumphant resurrection from the dead has bound Satan so that the church might not, might not, uh, can can continue the work of preaching the gospel. So this is the, the part of that that seems strange in verse, verse 3 there is, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. Is, does it mean that, that the devil can't, you know, that he, he doesn't lie and deceive? Well, Jesus called him the father of lies in John 8. So yeah, he obviously does, but can he keep the church from spreading the gospel? The gospel in this, you know, from the day of, of Jesus' ascension into heaven has gone to every corner of the world, and there wasn't a blessed thing the devil could do about it. And did he kill a lot of prophets preaching that gospel? He sure did. But did God's word go forth? Absolutely. God continued to accomplish his purposes so, and that's going to continue to be the case until the thousand years are ended. And again, whether the thousand years is, it's not literal. It just, whenever you hear that Satan is bound for a thousand years, think for, for whatever length of time it is, from the first coming of Jesus to his return, however long that lasts, might be 10,000 years, we don't know that God's going to accomplish his work and God's going to accomplish his purpose. And, you know, it's, it's already been 2,000 years, right? Could be much, could be much longer. We'll see. <coughs> After that, he must be released for a little while. Why? You know, why? Why do you have to release him? Why not just be done with him? Well, because God's God and that's what he's decided in his wisdom <clears throat> Excuse me. My voice is going on me. Any questions or any thoughts there? So we have, we do not really know when he's actually binding us. We would do. We would just. Our view of it would be. Rather than trying to pick out okay, at this moment, as we just say, in Jesus' work, yeah, his oh, ministry, okay. that he's that Satan is bound, that he's that Jesus is the escuderos, the stronger one, who comes to bind Satan and plunder his house, okay. and his and he does it. If you want to say he's doing it in his in his preaching and casting out demons, I think that definitely involves also his death and his resurrection from the dead, all of those things. So, but at first I was thinking, binding him 
could also be where he has to give Satan permission and and boundaries, which is what he did with Job. I mean, he had to come to yes to the Lord to find out what he can do to Job. Right. But Job, but he gave him a limitation. Right. You know, and Job's that's a good and. And that it's that's always been the case. God's always been God. Where whenever we describe the, the binding, I'm just looking for any other passage in Scripture that talks about Satan being bound. And in all of those, it's it's Jesus that's doing it, and He's doing it through His ministry. But you know, you're right. God set the boundaries that Job could not transgress, and that is, you know, that's another comforting thing in in for us in that during this millennial age, during this time till Jesus comes again, that Satan's bound is, is the devil could come into God's courtroom in, in the days of Job and say, Hey, what about your servant Job? But he doesn't have that standing anymore because Jesus has cast him out. Now, now Jesus is at the right hand of the father and, and uh, the devil can't talk his smack against the people of God. It's a little street lingo for you there. <laughs> so, <clears throat> yeah, I'm the cool pastor. <laughs> I'm sorry. All right. So after that, he must be released for a little while. In God's wisdom, he knows why. But um, it's for a little while, there's a, its own comfort in that that time reference. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Now, we've seen thrones in Revelation already. We've seen them in, in Revelation 4. We saw thrones in... I don't want to see them. Well, um, you know, chapter four, we saw the 24 sitting on the thrones. You think in, in Luke chapter 22, Jesus said, so they were talking about being great and the disciples and all that stuff. And Jesus said that when he comes again, that they were going to sit on 12 thrones in judgment. So, so this is, we've kind of heard this idea that with the 24, we viewed that as a picture of of the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament and the 12 apostles of the New as being kind of a picture of, of God's church and, and not necessarily 12 specific persons, or maybe God's church represented by those specific persons who are sitting on the thrones. Excuse me, but he says, I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. You could also make a very strong case. I think that that could be it is that that could be a picture of every single Christian and preacher of the gospel during the church age, this one thousand years, this millennial kingdom, that we sit on thrones and we we share God's word and are given authority to judge. That that's not something that belongs only to the the next life, but is also part of the work of God's people even now. And, and I think 1 Corinthians 6 would be a passage to think about along those lines. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, Paul says, Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is, is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? Do you not know that we are to judge angels? Huh? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have cases, if you have cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? He says, Paul is saying the church is going to be the, is judges the world. In Romans chapter 5, at, in verse 17, Uh, let me see. 
it can't be the right verse. Let me read it. <laughs> For if because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. All right, that's the part that I... I is Paul saying that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, that we who've received that free gift reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. I mean, R-E-I-G-N. We reign with him. And that same kind of language of the, of the thrones, those sitting on the thrones here, there's a sense in which God's church in this millennial age, by our preaching of law and gospel, you know, Jesus told the, the disciples, if you forgive anyone their sins, they're forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they're not forgiven. That, that, is a, that is a judging authority that God's given to his church to preach the gospel and during this millennial age and that God's going to use that. So that one, I, you know, whether he's talking about a, a, those seated on these thrones or a, a particular few like the apostles, I kind of take it as he's describing the whole church during the millennial age. <clears throat> and there's three different groups of people he's describing here, actually. So the second, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image. That's really is the talking about the beast the beast from the sea back in chapter 13. In chapter 13, the beast from the sea is, is the conjured up of the beast of the earth is going to try to get everybody to receive the mark of the beast. So there's, there's three different groups of people there that are given the, the right of judgment. The souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. The word there is the martyr, martyr is our word for martyr, which, you know, we tend to think of in, in the Gospels, that word means for those who don't necessarily die for, for the faith, but it's there that are bearing witness to Jesus. These have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus. And whether it's, whether he's in this vision seen literally just the, that particular group that are beheaded, that is the way of the common way of beheading a, like Paul was, had his head chopped off with an axe. James um, had his head chopped off with an axe. Um, and for the word of God, those who had not worshipped the beast or its image, again, Revelation 13 and 14, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands, and as a matter of fact, if, if you remember back in nine, chapter 9, not only do, did we not receive the mark, we received an, a positive mark. of we, we were marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit. So not only did, did God's people not receive the mark of Satan, but they were marked by the, the power of the Holy Spirit. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I've already, we've already tried to build the case that that thousand years is a, is like a, like the cattle on a thousand hills, or there's another Psalm that talks about the thousand, that God owns a thousand vines. Well, it was just a way of saying it's all his, it all belongs to him. We're making the case that that's what he's talking about during these thousand, these thousand years. And, these came to reign with Christ. We're suggesting that it is God's church that is reigning with Jesus during this thousand years and, and that come to life and preach the gospel and share the word of God. Well, what do we mean by, by they came to life? Well, I think we can answer that here in a second. That's a little bit later. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. 
This is the first resurrection. What is the first resurrection? It's for for that he's talking about. What does it mean that there's a first resurrection? Well, does that mean you know, we're going to be bodily raised a number of times? We would suggest that the first resurrection is the resurrection of faith. We were dead in our trespasses and sins, and God made us alive in Christ Jesus. That when God creates faith in the heart of a believer, that they're brought from spiritual death to spiritual life, and that that is the first resurrection, and then the second resurrection would be the bodily one. In in that way, the first death is really that spiritual death that already already claims us, but that, that second death is the eternal judgment. Well, let me see. The did not come to life until a thousand years are ended. John 5, Jesus talks about this. I won't, you know. I don't know if I have a couple minutes left, but let's we'll look at John chapter 5. Verse 24. Let me see. I'll start at at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment but is passed from death to life. Right? That's, the, that's conversion. Whenever we come, come to Jesus and, and are saved and have passed from death to life, truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of the judgment. He seems to be talking about two different dead here. In verse 25, he says, The time is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God. In other words, the time is here right now when the dead, he's talking about the spiritual dead, spiritually dead. He's not talking about the those that are in the ground, because he talks about the tombs later on. It's the spiritually dead who hear Jesus' voice and who hear it and live. They're raised with through faith. John uses that that language of of the the resurrection being us coming from spiritual death to spiritual life. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll give you a, a couple passages you can look at. Ephesians 2 verses 1 through 6. And as you're looking at this, remember the question is, does the scripture talk about conversion or giving the gift of faith? as a resurrection or as being brought from death to life. And you'll see in these verses it does. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 5. Then Colossians chapter 3 also. And then John 5 is the one that we saw already. So, all right, well, you know, we'll just, we'll come back to those. I'll let you look at some of them. But our position on this is that this first resurrection is the gift of faith. And the only other resurrection that's bodily is the one when Jesus comes again. But Christ has raised up believers that are his followers during the millennial age and they reign with him by preaching the gospel.
by preaching law and gospel, by forgiving sins and withholding forgiveness, by doing the work that God's given his, king, his church to do until our Lord Christ comes again. And I think that that is exactly what is happening in Revelation 12 when the woman flees away into the desert and the wilderness and, and is protected by God and carries out her work. Even while Satan's going to go go to chase the offsprings. Well, sorry about my voice. I appreciate your patience with that. We'll we'll have a prayer and then we'll be. I think we can meet next week. I, don't, I think we're all here. It's not Thanksgiving or anything. So, let's close. Father in heaven, we thank you for our time together today. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon your church. Make her bold. As, as your saints preach your law and gospel and faithfully serve you, we pray that you would continue to bind Satan and allow that work to go forward until the day that you come and take us home to heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.